Hi, I'm Dr. Julie Harper from Birmingham, Alabama. We're going to talk about spironolactone in the treatment of acne. This is my conflict of interest statement. So let's start at the very beginning. Anytime we're treating acne, we're treating acne well, we are trying to target the four main pathogenic pillars or targets in the development of acne. And those are the same in women and men, in adolescents and adults. And they are follicular epidermal hyperproliferation, excess sebum, C acnes, and inflammation. Where might spironolactone fit into this? So spironolactone can work as an anti-androgen. And so that's gonna have an impact on sebum with androgen hormones largely driving sebum, but also could have an impact on inflammation and I would say even follicular epidermal hyperproliferation. So spironolactone is FDA approved not for acne, but things like hypertension. It's an aldosterone antagonist. So it leads to diuresis and lowering of blood pressure. It is also though, and this is why we would use it in dermatology for things like androgenic alopecia in women, but also hirsutism and acne. It's an anti-androgen um, and it, it works as an anti-androgen through several different mechanisms. So it is an androgen receptor blocker or inhibitor. It actually decreases production of androgen. It inhibits 5-alpha reductase and it increases sex hormone binding globulin, which is then gonna sponge up any free testosterone, make, making it enable to interact with the androgen receptor. So my practical approach with spironolactin, and this is something that I've been using for many years, and I would bet many of you have now, although we've seen a big uptake in this over the last, I would say decade, but I use dosages from 25 to 200 milligrams. I will tell you in acne, most of the time, my maximum dose is 100 milligrams a day. Uh, in hair loss, it can be higher than that. And, and I would say that I think that there probably is a dose-related curve for efficacy, meaning the higher you drive the dose, the better it probably does work. But there's also a dose response curve as far as side effects go. So the higher we push the dose, the more side effect our patients may experience too. So it's kind of like when you're picking a retinoid and you're having to balance efficacy and tolerability. Here, when we're picking our dose, we're having to balance efficacy and tolerability from a side effect standpoint. I usually use this QD. You certainly can use it BID, and I will do that in people, for example, who are diuresing in the middle of the night or who have orthostatic hypotension in the day, and I wanna divide that dose out and give it BID, and so that's an option too. Most all the time we're gonna use this in combination with other medications, topicals with retinoids probably being one of the most common, but also benzoyl peroxide or topical dapsone or even topical antibiotics as long as they're in combination with a benzoyl peroxide. And you can certainly use it in combination with oral medications. Now, sometimes I think we use spironolactone because people don't want to be on, for example, an oral antibiotic. So this is a non-antibiotic alternative. But frequently I co-prescribe those at first because I, I have a tendency to think, and I can't prove this yet, I have a tendency to think that the antibiotic is faster. And so if I can get a jump start with that and overlap spironolactone and doxycycline, then when I stop the doxy or sericycline or minocycline, when I stop it at three to four months, then the spironolactone is there on board um, and it kicks in then at about the time we stop that. I don't have any proof of that yet, but we're going to get some. You can also overlap this with isotretinoin. It's a great idea to overlap it with a birth control pill because it helps us to just lessen the most common side effect with this. But you don't have to do that. And I would say that, uh, again, many of the, the people who take spironolactone want the benefit of something that works hormonally, and yet maybe they have a contraindication to the birth control pill and they can't take it. So you can use it with or without a birth control pill. But there are side effects. The number one is menstrual irregularities, but also breast tenderness and swelling, fatigue, headaches, diuresis, diuresis, orthostatic hypotension. And then, as I said, higher doses do equal higher rates of side effects. This was a really nice publication published by Allison Layton in 2017, and it looked at, it kind of compiled studies. So the two columns there on the left are from randomized controlled trials with spironolactone. On the right, we see case series, and so you can see the number of people in each of these. But when those were all pooled together and you looked at side effects, by far, looking at percentage here, the most common side effect was menstrual irregularity. And so, you know, take, take that home with you and realize then 
that if somebody has an IUD or they're on a birth control pill or they're postmenopausal or they've had a hysterectomy, uh, whatever it is, if, they, if they're not having periods, then you could likely start that dose higher and your patient benefit from that without having the most common side effect. So how quickly does it work? We have no good objective answer yet. So far, studies are small and frequently spironolactone is used just as an add-on with other medications. I counsel patients that it may be a little bit slower. It may take three months to kick in, but I'm really happy that we're going to get some answers to that soon, and we'll talk about that in just a second. How long? Um, this is long-term treatment, so when you start this, you're not planning your exit strategy like you are when you start an antibiotic. When you start this, you look at the patient and you say, now this is going to be long-term treatment. If it works for you, you're probably going to be on this for years. And I think that can be a negative for some people, but then let's just think practically about the number of people who come to clinic who never want to stop their oral antibiotic. And so there are people who love long-term treatment as long as it's working and this seems to be safe over the long haul. That second bullet at the bottom there just did surveys of 91 women followed for eight years. They'd on average been on it for longer than two years and they found no serious illness thought to be attributed, attributable to spironolactone. But we're going to get more information. We know um, that there's some ongoing trials right now, one in Europe and one in the United States, comparing spironolactone to doxycycline. And this is the one in Europe. This They're going to compare spironolactone for six months versus dox, doxy for three months. And both groups are also going to be on benzoyl peroxide. But I think it'll be interesting here to see, does one kick in faster? Does one work better? And then the one in the U.S. is going to be a little more like directly head to head with 16 weeks of spironolactone, 100 milligrams a day versus 16 weeks of doxycycline, 100 milligrams a day. And so I just, you know, we're going to have data. Does one group work better than the other or kick in faster than the other? And that's coming. Okay, risks. Potassium, I would say that most of the time we don't need to be checking potassium in our healthy young women taking spironolactone for acne. And that was based on this study that was published in 2015. I know you've seen this, but just to remind you. So they looked at healthy young women between the ages of 18 and 45. They had no cardiovascular disease, no renal failure. They weren't on any other medicines that could affect the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And they looked at those taking spironolactone for acne and then a control group. And they found that, yeah, there's a little bit of, you know, underlying hyperkalemia, 0.72% in those being treated for acne, 0.76% in the control population. And so from this, the take home was that we don't need to be checking routine potassium monitoring in those healthy young patients. This was a follow-up to that in 2019 that, and it was a smaller study here. So they looked at women, 618 women who had received spironolactone for acne. Now the word was already out because they weren't checking a lot of, of potassium here. In fact, out of the 618, 133 had available potassium measurements before and after starting spironolactone. Out of those, 112 of them were young between 18 and 45, 12 were in that slightly older age group of 46 to 65. But what they noticed is that, you know, percentage wise, there was certainly more hyperkalemia in that older age group, even though the overall number was low. And so I think this just reinforces that over that age of 45, we probably should be checking potassium. If you ask me when and how, I'm just totally making it up. The package insert, I believe says within a few weeks of starting it, I usually just do it at baseline and then like at month two or three when I see them back. And then I may do it yearly in that older age group, but I'm kind of guessing there to be honest. So we're still going to check it in older age. If people have renal or cardiac disease, number one, I'd probably be using something else, but you would want to check then. Same thing with impaired hepatic function. And I would say check it in higher doses, 200 milligrams a day if you're doing that. Also, if they're on other medications like ACE inhibitors, but also NSAIDs, um, people on salt substitutes, uh, potassium supplementation, and trimethoprim. Okay, breast cancer. We know there is a black box warning with spironolactone. That does not say that spironolactone causes breast cancer. It says that it's been shown to be a tumorigen in chronic toxicity studies in rats. Spironolactone should be used only in those conditions described under indications and usage. And by the way, acne is not on that list. Um, and unnecessary use of the drug should be avoided. But this is when, this is a rat study. These are rat studies. These rats were given 25 to 100 times higher doses than those that would be administered to a human. 
And so what do we do with that? Well, we now have, and these are about 10 years old now, we now have two large epidemiologic studies that just look at exposure to spironolactin and then diagnosis of breast cancer. This particular one looked at 2.3 million women, 20 years of age and older, followed for 28.8 million person years using a Danish nationwide prescription drug registry. There were 1.3 million spironolactone prescriptions over the time where they were looking, and they found no evidence of an increased risk of breast, uterus, or ovarian cancer with spironolactone. This was also a very large epidemiologic study. Now we're looking at women over the age of 55, but large numbers. Uh, we're looking at people exposed to spironolactone versus those unexposed. And again, they found no difference in breast cancer rates between those exposed and not exposed to spironolactin. So that makes us feel a lot better about it. And then just in 2020, this was an interesting study that was done by Adam Friedman and his group. And they, they actually decided, what about people who have had breast cancer? What, what happens to them if they're exposed to spironolactone? Is there a higher rate of breast cancer recurrence? And so they went to a Humana Insurance database from 2005 to 2017, they looked for ICD-9 and 10 codes for personal history of breast cancer, and this was women only. They used drug codes to identify exposure to spironolactin. So they found 30, about 30,000 patients who'd had a history of breast cancer and then had insurance for two years following that. And within that two years would be the most likely time to see a recurrence. Of course, they all had to be female too for this particular study. They found 746 people who'd had breast cancer who were followed for this two-year period, who were prescribed spironolactin. Most of the subjects here were older, so it probably was not for acne, but it still gives us some interesting information. And in this, there was not a higher rate of recurrence. It was not associated with breast cancer recurrence. And so we're just getting more and more comfortable with this idea that maybe spironolactin is safe in women, even who've had a personal history of breast cancer. Now, this is not about acne, but there's two things I just wanted to throw in here because they teach us something about spironolactone. So one, this was a study that was really just kind of a review article about, okay, what about those patients who've had breast cancer? They're on endocrine therapies. They have hair loss. Could we use something like spironolactone or even finasteride if we needed it in these patients. And the concern with spironolactone would be, you know, if you're anti-androgen, are you overall being pro-estrogenic? And then would that worry us for these breast cancer survivors who are on ongoing treatment? So a review of 47 studies said there is no evidence of a drug-drug interaction, at least, with endocrine therapies and spironolactone or 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. There were six studies with a total of 95 patients on spironolactone that actually looked at circulating levels of estrogen. And I thought this was really interesting. Now, we don't know if these women, what age they were or if they were menstruating, because we know there can be hormonal fluctuations during the, the menstrual cycle. But what they found is with oral spironolactone, estrogen overall systemically circulating increased in 26% of people it actually decreased in 6% of people and it was unchanged in the, in the majority and 67% it was unchanged. And so that should also give us a little bit of comfort. You know, what is spironolactone doing systemically versus maybe what is it doing uh, at the level of the androgen receptor in the sebaceous gland? I don't know that we have all of that figured out. But their conclusion was that based on hormonal and pharmacologic activity, spironolactone may be considered for further research in alopecia, even in people who've had breast cancer. And then again, not related specifically to acne here, but when you're thinking about overall the anti-androgen, the systemic anti-androgen effect of spironolactone, what about its use in transgender women? So this was a study that wanted to compare the overall anti-androgenic effects of uh, spironolactone, which is of course a systemic anti-androgen, but compare it to cyproterone acetate, which is a progestin not available in the US, but known to be an anti-androgen. And so this was 52 people, it was single-blinded, everyone was on estrogen, and then they were either given as their anti-androgen spironolactone, 100 milligrams a day, or, spiron or cyproterone acetate, 25 milligrams a day, and this was for 12 weeks. And the bottom two bullets really are the take home message. 90% of those who received cyproterone acetate achieved female range testosterone. 
and only about 20% of those on spironolactone. So it didn't seem quite as good systemically at reducing testosterone as the cyproterone acetate did. Now I would wonder what about if it would have been 200 milligrams a day, maybe that would have made a difference. Is there a dose response curve? You know, is there, is there a difference? Does spironolactone do different things at different dosages? What dose is required to be SIBO suppressive? What dose is required to maybe be anti-inflammatory? What dose is required to cause gynecomastia in a guy? Maybe any dose, I don't know. But is there a dose response curve that gives us different results in our patients? So just things that we, you know, still some questions that are left unanswered. Okay, clotting often comes up because you guys are smart and you realize that with other hormonal therapies, for example, combination oral contraceptive pills, we have to be careful because with them, there is an increased risk of venous thromboembolism. And so we're talking about another hormonal therapy. How concerned do I have to be about clotting here? And I'm gonna say something really bold. You don't have to be. In fact, we think that spironolactin may be protective against that. Now, there's no study done on this in acne, but there are studies done looking at people who are hypertensive. We know that hypertensive patients can have impaired fibrinolytic activity. This was a little study, 14 people who were hypertensive versus 14 who were not. All of the hypertensive patients were treated with spironolactone, 50 milligrams a day for just one week. Blood samples for plasminogen activator inhibitor antigen uh, one and tissue plasminogen activator. All of those were obtained at baseline and after one week. And the mean PAI one, decreased after one week of spironolactone and the mean TPA levels actually increased. So just in case we don't remember what all of those do, the take home in red there is that spironolactone actually improves this impaired fibrinolysis or fibrinolysis in systemic hypertension. So if anything, it may have a protective effect. Okay, how about pregnancy and lactation with spironolactone? So we know spironolactone is pregnancy category C it should not be used during pregnancy. There, it carries with it an increased risk of hypospadias and feminization of the male fetus. And I would still say, I say this every time, I believe that that's only hypothetical. I do not believe that that has been reported yet. Although I also think for many years, this was used in an older population. And we're just now bringing this down into an age group where people might have pregnancies exposed to this. So we'll get more information on this, but that risk would really be late first trimester. So if somebody were to find themselves pregnant and they're early in their pregnancy and they're on spironolactone, we simply stop the drug and we don't panic. I do always think it's so interesting that both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the World Health Organization classify spironolactone as compatible with lactation. Uh, the, and that is because spironolactone is, is metabolized to canrenone, and that canrenone met metabolite has been found in breast milk at extremely low levels, 0.2% of the maternal dose. So this is a product that you could use in somebody who is nursing. And so that's a kind of a quick run through spironolactone. I think it's a drug that many of us are using more and more frequently. It gives us a non-antibiotic alternative. It works very well through some unique mechanisms, including having, having an impact on sebum. It's a product that is uh, affordable and accessible to our patients. Unfortunately, at least based on what we know on it right now, we can only use it in women. Um, but this is something that, that I think we're all getting more comfortable with. We're seeing it slide down and being used in a slightly younger age group. I think most people would say to still limit this to um, patients who have already established their period and their cycle, and then wait about one year after that before you start it. But I hope that just gives you kind of an update on some ways to use it safely. And I hope it even makes you ask a few more questions about spironolactin so that we can all uh, answer those questions together and learn more about its use uh, to benefit our patients who have acne. Thank you so much for your attention.